proper evaluation of the optic disc is one of the most important skills you'll ever need in practicing ophthalmology. And I hope this presentation will help you do that. I owe what I'm sharing with you today to the wisdom and teaching of my mentor, Professor Richard Simmons of Harvard University. Dr. Simmons did not spare anything in the way of us fellows becoming glaucoma experts. Some of the slides shown in this presentation are used with the kind permission of Professor Wallace Arwood. Dr. Arwood is the Frederick Blody Chair of Ophthalmology at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. And finally, my dear friend, Dr. Mohammed Said, who is an assistant professor of clinical ophthalmology at Tascan Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, Florida. Mohammed inspired me and many others on the use of OCT in glaucoma, and I wish him every success in his career. I can't remember the number of wrong optic disc drawings that I've made during my first six months of fellowship training. However, I can remember very well the day when my optic disc drawings were marked as correct. As you can see, missing the total loss of the temporal neurotin rim in the right optic disc and the small but significant inferior notch in the neurotin rim on the left optic disc were not allowed in a glaucoma practice. Before discussing the optic disc, let's go for some elementary neurophysiology. Neurons in the central nervous system survive by communication with each other. If they don't communicate, they simply die. Communication inside the neuron is bidirectional, anterograde from the soma through the exoplasmic flow to the synapse, then through the synapse to the next soma, and retrograde in the opposite direction. This diagram shows a neuron, a retinal ganglion cell which has to exit the eye through the lamina carposa and complete its path to terminate in the lateral geniculate nucleus. Retinal ganglion cell axonal damage in the optic nerve head occurs early in glaucoma. Both retrograde degeneration and Wallerian degeneration may be involved. Regardless of the cause of axonal injury in glaucoma, an active molecular process is likely to occur both proximal and distal to the site of injury. Note that the axonal damage in glaucoma takes place at the lamina carposa. However, the same changes will occur if the retinal ganglion cell axon was damaged anywhere along its entire path to the lateral geniculate nucleus. The damage involves both ends of the retinal ganglion cell, leading to slow degradation of the soma with chromatolysis, followed by loss of the entire neuron. In the case of the retinal ganglion cell, the interruption of synaptic communication down the visual pathway will eventually lead to similar degenerative changes in the visual cortex neurons. Uh, what about the reverse pathway? Well, the same happens in the opposite direction. With injury to the visual cortex neurons, the damage will eventually show in the retinal ganglion cells corresponding to the area of cortical injury. Now, almost 40% of all afferent and efferent fibers to the brain at any time carry visual information. The retinal ganglion cell axons via the optic nerve project to more than 23 sites in the brain, mostly to the lateral geniculate nucleus. As mentioned earlier, the site of damage in glaucoma is the lamina carposa, but these axons are subject to trauma at any point in their path. And once affected, the pattern of damage reflected in a visual field or an OCT may mimic or distort that of glaucoma. In glaucoma, the damage of the retinal ganglion cells starts at the optic nerve head, and with the slow degradation in the retinal ganglion cells and the genicular cortical neurons, we start to see visual field defects and loss in the ganglion cell layer on OCT. With progression of glaucoma, there is neural degenerative changes in the retrobulbar and intracranial optic nerve, lateral geniculate nucleus, and the visual cortex of the brain. As a result, in very advanced primary open angle glaucoma, the brain shows neurodegenerative changes similar to those of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinsonism. So, in reality, glaucoma is not an isolated ocular pathology but rather a widespread neurodegenerative disease. What about the reverse? 
In the presence of cleft occipital cortical pathology and in the absence of ocular disease, the lost ganglion cell layer seen on OCT corresponds to the right hemianopic visual field effect. This reflects the damage of the retinal ganglion cells resulting from the cortical lesion. Being a chronic, blinding, widespread neurodegenerative disease, the diagnosis of glaucoma may be best achieved using multiple modalities. Optic disc examination is an objective test that allows us to detect the specific features of glaucomatous optic neuropathy and document our findings at any stage of the disease. Looking for glaucoma usually involves good history, ophthalmoscopy, and some ancillary tests like visual fields and OCT. Having an afferent papillary defect is a very late sign in glaucoma and its presence at presentation may point to other problems affecting the optic nerve. So if you suspect other pathology involved in the optic nerve and or the visual pathway, then of course further testing is required. You may or may not agree with me, but I consider direct ophthalmoscopy the best technique for evaluating the optic disc, particularly in glaucoma. It gives an erect magnified image of the optic disc, and with a bit of practice, you might be able to detect monocular clues to the depths of the cup and the slope of the new retinal rim. As you are essentially examining a blind spot, the light of the direct ophthalmoscope should not disturb your patient, allowing you repeated examinations of the disc without pupil constriction. And by the time you have examined the optic disc, the eye may be light adapted enough and you can have a look at the macula. Using a direct ophthalmoscope to document your findings helps remembering all the small details of the optic disc. It is the best way to avoid hasty or wrong diagnosis of glaucoma and other optic disc abnormalities. Having said that, uh, direct ophthalmoscopy may not be very appropriate at such times when you have to keep a distance from your, your patients because of the COVID-19. Some patients may not be able to cooperate with you for one reason or another. And in the presence of media opacities, it may be more productive to use indirect ophthalmoscopy at the slit lamp. To perform indirect ophthalmoscopy at the slit lamp, you need a 60 or a 90 diopter lens. This will give you a stereoscopic view of a much smaller image than that of the direct ophthalmoscope. Before you start, you need to make sure that you are using both eyes, not just one, by closing one at a time to check for stereopacies. Of course, you need to dilate the pupil in most cases, and you still have to mentally correct the inverted image before documenting your findings. By narrowing the beam, you focus on the optic disc area and the immediately adjacent retina, and start examining the details of the optic disc. A thin beam of light should be used for measuring the vertical length of the optic disc. The slit beam is, is then shortened to fit the vertical length of the disc between 12 and 6 o'clock positions. Then you look at the dial at the column of the slit lamp to read the measurements. In this particular example, it's 2 mm. Then we use the lens manufacturer's specific correction factor for the lens. In the previous example of 2 mm, using two different 60 diopter lenses will yield two different measurements. Of course, you can use the same way to estimate the vertical width of the cup and calculate the cup disc ratio if you wish. You need to keep in mind that indirect ophthalmoscopy results in two types of magnification. The first is linear or surface magnification, M, which is the result of dividing the diopteric power of the eye by the diopteric power of the lens, and in the case of a plus 60 lens, it is 1. And the second is axial or depth magnification, M square, which in the case of a 60 diopter lens is still 1. This means that there is equal magnification of both the surface of the disc and the depth of the optic cup. With the use of 90 diopter lens, the virtual depth of the cup will be greater by 6 times that of the surface, giving the illusion of a much deeper cup than it really is. So, with a head mounted indirect ophthalmoscope, it may be better to use a 14 diopter or a 15 diopter lens rather than the usual 20 diopter lens to examine the optic disc of a child in the office or in the operating theater. 
what about the intercular pressure? Can we depend on intercular pressure to diagnose glaucoma? And uh, what is the normal intercular pressure? Despite the general consensus that the normal intercular pressure is somewhere between 10 and 20 millimeters of mercury, we don't really know which particular number would prevent the development of glaucoma in any particular eye. And as a result, we don't know what would be considered normal for any eye. In addition, we don't know what kind of pressure gradient is causing the damage. Is it the transcornea pressure gradient between the barometric readings on the outside and the inside of the eye, which we do nowadays? Or is it the translaminar corposa pressure gradient between the CSF pressure and the intercular pressure? Or is it the transmural pressure gradient between the mean arterial blood pressure and the intercular pressure? Or is it indeed a combination of all of the above? Although Goldman Aplination Tonometer is considered to be the gold standard in glaucoma diagnosis, yet it is far from ideal for all cases, and it depends on cornea thickness, clarity, and uh, a lot of biomechanics which we are still trying to understand. Finally, is glaucoma synonymous with raised intercrop pressure? Of course not, and yet most therapeutic efforts so far have focused on lowering the intercrop pressure. What about the visual fields? Can we depend on the visual fields alone to diagnose glaucoma? The visual field testing is purely subjective and is subject to training and aging factors, of course. One of the most important facts to remember, really, about the visual field is that it is subject to the presence of other lesions in the visual pathway, which may confuse the picture altogether. This patient of mine had a progressive glaucoma for seven years, and then suddenly he presented with this visual field, which completely distorted the glaucomatous field changes. His original visual field plot uh, looked something like this. But now with the added pathology, it's very difficult to use the visual field to track progression of his glaucoma. I call this a glaucoma plus visual field. The value of uh, visual field plotting and diagnosing early glaucoma is questionable. Because of the way the receptive fields work, ensuring a large neuronal function reserve of the retina and the cerebral cortical centers, it is only after a substantial part of the nerve fibers and nerve fiber layer are lost that we start to see field changes. In advanced disease, however, when the neuroretinal ray is thinned out, visual field is of value in tracking the progression of glaucoma, provided there is no other conflicting pathology. Optic disc photography is, of course, the best way to document your findings and educate your patient. Photographs lack depth, however, and requesting a pair of stereo photos may prove very difficult nowadays. However, my advice is always take a photo. It usually proves very valuable for a glaucoma patient. Optical coherence tomography has become a standard practice in following up glaucoma suspects and established glaucoma cases. For a good follow-up, a basic set of two to four or more tests are done for each eye on the first visit. This will establish a good set of average measurements, which will then be compared to subsequent tests in the future. The retinal nerve fiber layer thickness maps with their characteristic butterfly appearance represent the true tomography of the nerve fiber layer. They will reflect instantly any loss of the nerve fiber layer and give you a good idea of what to expect in the rest of the printout. Always check the optic disc area to avoid errors in data due to an abnormally large optic disc. Due to the wide variation of the normal retinal nerve fiber layer thickness as evidenced by the wide green band in the testnet plot, one should not assume it's okay as long as it is in the green. Thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer should be followed from the average of the primary set of measurements onwards to detect progression before it reaches the yellow or red bands of the plot. In this case, and despite the thinning, it was overlooked because it is still in the green. That's why we should keep track of the average retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and have a look at the difference between tests for the same eye and also the difference between the two eyes. If there is a difference of 9 microns between the two eyes, that may be an early sign of glaucoma. So, if the average retinal nerve fiber layer thickness is getting less over time, that means progression even if it's still in the green. 
So it is always wise to follow up progression using more than one modality because it may show in the visual fields as worsening of the mean deviation and the pattern standard deviation. Thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer may occur due to age, high myopia, or floor effect of a parameter. So even if it is in the red, one should observe for progression and compare OCT findings with visual field results. Dr. Mohammed Said shared this case of a patient who has been followed for a long time only by optical coherence tomography with intraocular pressure fluctuating between high teens and high 20s. No diagnosis of glaucoma was made because the distant plot of the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness on OCT was always in the green. Also, the differences between the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness maps of the right and left eyes were apparently overlooked. Due to the large optic disc area in both eyes, uh, 3.77 mm square in the right eye and 4.25 mm square in the left eye, the automatically created calculation circle with a fixed diameter of 3.46 mm may have measured within the optic disc instead of outside it, misleading the physician and keeping the retinal nerve fiber layer in the green. This is a perfect example of the so called green disease due to the shortage of the numated database, creating a false negative result. For comparison, this is an OCT of another patient with a much more average optic disc size, where the calculation circle is actually measuring the nerve fiber layer thickness. When visual fields were finally plotted, they showed advanced glaucomatous changes, more in the left than in the right eye. This case illustrates few points regarding optical coherence tomography. First, when interpreting the OCT report, it's good practice to not limit your search to the testnet plot alone. Second, always start at the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness maps, looking for the classic butterfly configuration of the stacked nerve fibers at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock positions. Third, it's also a good practice to look at the size of the optic disc, as it may be abnormally large and misleading like in this case. And finally, don't limit your diagnosis and follow-up of glaucoma cases or suspects to one modality. Combining OCT with visual field and optic disc photographs may be in the best interest of your patient. As mentioned earlier, the gangrene cell layer analysis may reflect changes due to lesions in the visual pathway other than glaucoma. These may also show individual field plotting. So if your glaucoma patient has developed a sudden change in either tests, a careful revision of patient's history is a must and an MRI may be warranted. Like any testing modality, optical coherence tomography has its own limitations and pitfalls. The retinal nerve fiber layer normative database is based on a small number of people and in some machines it's the same race and does not take account of age, refractive errors, axial length or the unusually large optic disc size. And a normative database for the younger than 18 is lacking. Finally, the measurements for the ganglion cell layer may be affected by added visual pathway pathology just like visual fields. So far, we know that all ancillary testing for glaucoma may not be sensitive enough or specific enough to diagnose glaucoma and that we must spend some time looking at the optic disc to diagnose and follow up our patients. So what do we see when we look at the optic disc? The first step in examining the optic disc is indeed to find it. So let's try to localize the optic disc in the following four slides. Can you identify the exact margin of the optic disc in this photo? What about this one? And this one? This one should be the easiest. Where's the optic disc? Well, let's pause for a minute and have a look at the anatomy of the optic disc head. The transparent optic nerve fibers exit the eye through the scleral optic foramen. The scleral spur represents the margin of the scleral optic foramen. When seen by the ophthalmoscope, it's referred to as the scleral ring or the ilchnic scleral ring. 
Clinically speaking, everything inside the scleral ring is optic disc and everything outside it is retina. So once you've seen the ring, you are looking at the optic disc. Here's the ring and the real optic disc. The anatomical scleral ring is most frequently seen in the temporal area of the optic disc and at times it can be seen in the nasal area as well. Having identified the scleral ring, then the contour of the optic disc is easy to classify. This particular optic disc is round with a vertical oval cup. In the presence of opaque myelinated nerve fibers, however, the disc margin is hazy. And indeed, in the case of patellar with swollen nerve fibers, the scleral ring cannot be seen, except maybe in this example for a faint edge at the superior temporal rim. After identifying the disc margin, one should decide on the size and contour of the optic disc. Now, Dr. Jonas and his colleagues from Germany studied the optic disc size in 450 normal subjects back in 1988. The majority had a disc size of 2.4 mm square. And outside the standard deviation, any size below 0.9 was a small disc, and any disc larger than 4.5 mm square was considered a large optic disc. The study also showed the correlation between the disc size and the cup size, concluding that if the disc size is smaller than 1.5 mm square, the presence of a cup may be unusual. Why is it important to be able to estimate the optic disc size clinically? Well, first, there is a fixed number of nerve axons, around 1.2 million, passing through the optic foramen. So if the opening is large, there will be plenty of room left in the middle, resulting in a large cup. And if the opening is small, then all the fibers will be crowded with no or a very small room left. So there will be a small or no cup at all. So, if you see a small optic disc with an obvious cup, it may be pathological. Second, if the optic disc is very small, a micro disc, or very large, a macro disc, then one should think of some of the systemic associations which may be linked to the size of the optic disc. And finally, you may avoid mistakes due to an abnormally large optic disc while interpreting the findings of an OCT. An easy way to estimate the size of the optic disc is to use the 0.5 mm light spot in the director thumb scope and move it around the optic disc. In case of a large disc, the light spot will move around to be able to cover the entire disc area. And in a small optic disc, you may not need to move at all to cover the entire disc area. Another way of estimating the disc size is to compare the size of the blood vessels to the overall area they occupy in the optic disc. In a large disc, they will take a much smaller area of the surface than in a small disc where they will be crowded in the middle occupying a large area of the surface. Micro discs in general are associated with midline cerebral and cranial defects like uh, hydrocephaly, anencephaly, septo-optic dysplasia, uh, craniofacial maldevelopments, uh, deafness, craniopharyngioma, and or optic nerve glioma. Macrodiscs, on the other hand, may be associated with midline defects in the skull and the face, like encephalocele and cleft palate. Most neurosurgeons consider encephalocele as a surgical emergency, especially in the pediatric age group. The next thing to do is to examine each nerve separately. Looking at the right optic disc, it's smallish, round, and with no cupping. Now, looking at the left optic disc, again, it's small, rounded, with a small cup. So, small disc, small cup, that looks okay. Well, the right disc had no cup, and there is a cup in the left eye. As a matter of fact, there is a small but significant notch inferiorly as well. That now looks like asymmetric optic discs with asymmetric cupping. So, repeated examinations of the two eyes will easily reveal the difference for you. The right of the disc is a micro disc with the classic double ring sign, and the left one is a small disc with an obvious cup and an inferior notch. The intercular pressure was 48 mm of mercury in both eyes. At 
this stage, we should go back to the optic disk photos that we shared before. In this photo, you can see that it's rather a small oval optic disk with a flat surface, no cupping, in a highly myopic eye. Here, if you trace the disk margin, you'll see that it is an oval tilted optic disk, again with no cupping. Again, an oval tilted disk, high myopia, and no cupping. Finally, here's a small oval vertical disc with no cupping in a posterior staphyloma in a highly myopic eye. Having been able to identify the location of the optic disc, let's talk about features of normality and features of glaucomatous optic neuropathy. The normal optic disc is round or slightly vertically oval with a 1.5 to 2.2 millimeter average diameter, a pink neurator rim, and a center cup. Uh, the usual cup disc ratio is about 0.1 to 0.4, and a cup disc ratio more than 0.6 is only present in 5% of normal individuals. What about the glaucomatous optic neuropathy? Well, progressive cupping of the optic disc is the hallmark of glaucomatous optic neuropathy. It is the result of progressive thinning of the neuroretinal rim with excavation of the optic disc. Having said that, the mere presence of cupping alone is non-specific for glaucoma diagnosis. Documentation of the stage and progression of the neurotic rim loss is essential for diagnosing and treating glaucoma. If the patient presents at an early stage, then we have time to document progression and treat early enough. With late presentation, however, the disease pattern becomes more obvious with high intraocular pressure, characteristic field loss, OCT findings, evidence of ischemia, etc. Apart from progressive thinning of the neuroretinal rim, other features of glaucoma damage include pallor of the cup and knot of the rim, loss of retinal ganglion cells, and optic disc hemorrhage. Each of these features alone is again not specific for glaucoma. Are there any other causes for cupping? Well, in rare cases of arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, there may be some cupping of the optic disc. However, the clinical course is quite different from that of glaucoma. Some congenital optic disc anomalies may be confused with glaucomatous cupping, like optic disc coloboma, or some of the cases of morning glory syndrome. Again, monitoring such patients will usually reveal their non-progressive nature. Um, I'm used to drawing my own optic disc findings, and uh, I would show you how to document your optic disc findings by drawing them. It may take you some time, especially at the start of your career, but it is a very worthy exercise because it will teach you how to look for details. So we begin with drawing a circle corresponding to the scleral ring. Then we identify the edge of the cup which is the inner margin of the neuroretinal rim, which requires a good inspection of its width and its color. In the temporal area, we should also look for any sloping temporal margin, which may confuse us as to the real boundary of the cup. We start by drawing the nasal edge of the neuroretinal rim, uh, because the cup here is more obvious towards the nasal side. After careful documentation of the sloping temporal margin of the rim, the inside of the cup area should be inspected for any laminar show. The laminar cryptosa lays deep in the optic disc and doesn't usually show in average or small sized optic discs. If the laminar cryptosa is seen, then we should decide whether it is uniform across the whole cup or is it taking different levels, which may indicate asymmetry in the cup depth and the presence of a notch. This is usually known by the difference in the size of the laminar openings being larger and more oval as the cupping gets deeper. In this particular optic disc, the laminar cryptosa is seen across the whole cup area with a deep notch and large laminar openings inferiorly. The laminar show is inspected carefully for depth and then documented.
it may be useful to document the presence and position of two or three circumlinear blood vessels on the cup area at least at presentation and once yearly afterwards. Here is the drawing process seen sequentially for your reference. In this optic disc with advanced glaucoma, the etching ring can be seen almost entirely because of the marked thinning of the retinal nerve fibers. Again, attention to details is the key for documenting all the findings. Note the total loss of the new retinal rim in a whole quadrant inferior nasally with adjacent binating of the blood vessels, the nasal cupping, and the pale deep cup. Here are some subtle changes in a moderately advanced glaucomatous optic neuropathy with a superior and an inferior notching, nasal cupping, and deep laminar show. Personally, I don't pay much attention to the cup disc ratio. Uh, because of the great intervariability between different examiners and intravariability within the same examiner at different times of the day. Um, in a normal eye, the cup disc ratio is larger vertically than horizontally, ranging in a normal population between 0.0, .0 and almost 0.8. And in a large sized optic disc, a high cup disc ratio is expected. However, uh, these eyes should not be diagnosed with glaucoma based only on the size of the cup. On the other hand, eyes with small optic disc and cupping should be investigated thoroughly for glaucoma. A cup disc asymmetry, though, of more than 0.2 can be an early sign of glaucoma. However, the two discs should be of the same size to diagnose asymmetric cups. In this particular example, um, and at first sight, the right optic disc uh, looks like uh, having a larger cup than the left. But on a closer look, the two optic discs are asymmetric in size, and the cup disc ratio is actually identical between them. The position of the cup, rather than its size, has more diagnostic and prognostic importance. Here, the cup disc ratio is 0.3. But if that same excavation was found nearer to the margin of the disc, then we have a very significant loss of the neuroretinal rim, which may indicate severe glaucomatous damage. This optic disc has a vertical cup and a cup disc ratio of 0.7. However, the total loss of the neuroretinal rim inferiorly is more significant for the diagnosis and staging of glaucoma. This optic disc is tilted, oval and with severe glaucomatous loss of the near retinal rim. Which cut disc ratio should we consider? Straight vertical or tilted in line with the contour of the disc? I'm sure some of you will say the straight vertical and others will say no, it should be the line aligned with the tilt of the optic disc. So there is a great deal of variability between different examiners and if one considers this is a 0.6 on a good day, then maybe by the end of the same day, when he or she is a bit tired, the same disc would feel like a definite 0.8. Finally, any particular cup disc ratio does not mean glaucoma, nor would it help as a prognostic factor for glaucoma progression. So, to reiterate, the loss of the neuroretinal rim could be focal and is called notching. This particular notch is very deep at the scleral ring, resulting in what is sometimes called an acquired optic disc pit and is adjacent to an area of inferior nerve fiber layer defect. The second form of neuroretinal rim loss is equal all around and that's concentric loss, where the rim is lost circumferentially and the cup enlarges in all directions. Then we have the glaucomatous optic disc in myopia with tilted disc, pale vertical cup, pronounced beta and alpha zones temporal to the disc, and a small optic disc hemorrhage. Then finally, we have the total loss of the neuroretinal rim with marked pallor of the cup and very advanced glaucoma. Stenoid sclerosis or socialization of the disc is seen when the entire rim collapses without much nasal shifting of the blood vessels. 
It is seen in old age with peripatellar atrophy and in some cases of normal tension glaucoma. This is a perfect example of normal symmetrical large optic discs and large cups. This is an example of a large pathological deep cup with laminar show, inferior notching, and inferior nerve fiber layer loss and bearing of blood vessels. The laminar openings are relatively large, indicating deep cupping. The cup area is also quite pale, but the pallor is contained within the cup. This is an example of what I call a terminal cup. The total loss of the neutral rim is obvious, with a cup disc ratio of 1. The retinal vasculature stands out clearly, indicating advanced diffuse loss of the nerve fiber layer. This is a perfect example of documented progression over 30 years with concentric loss of the neuroretinal rim. Notice the course of the circumlinear blood vessel and how it has collapsed over the years due to loss of the supporting astrocytes. Another great documentation of progression over 39 years of follow-up. Again, notice the position of this blood vessel as it collapses due to loss of the supporting glial cells. Again, a well-documented progression over a rather short time for glaucoma, 8 years. Thankfully, with the advancement of our tracking technology using retina scanners and now OCT, we are able to identify early changes to hold or try to hold the progression of glaucoma. Now, this is a remarkable example of asymmetric copying and traumatic glaucoma with a terminal disc in the left eye together with healed choroidal rupture as evidence of severe trauma. Another example of asymmetric copying with advancing glaucoma in the right eye as evidenced by the deep notch inferiorly and the disc hemorrhage with the nerve fiber layer defect superior temporally. So, what else besides loss of the retinaginous cell and glial tissue should we be looking for? One of the most important features to look at is pallor. In glaucoma, progressive pallor is expected in the cup area, but not in the neuroretinal rim. The rim is indeed lost and thinned out, but it does not develop pallor in glaucoma. So, what if we see a pale neuroretinal rim? Well, perhaps you should repeat your history taking, examine for optic nerve rather than for optic disc pathology, and if needed, do brain imaging. Most people with old ocular or head injuries would have forgotten their trauma by the time they see you. They usually come back in their next visit, having remembered all about it. But what about laminar show? In this optic disc, there is a deep laminar show with large oval and slit-like openings, yet the neuroretinal rim looks healthy, and the disc size is on the large side. I would not classify this as pathological. However, in this optic disc to the left, there are large oval and rounded laminar openings inferiorly within a deep notch. The upper part of the cup looks more superficial with much smaller openings. I would classify this as pathological. Uh, red free or black and white photos uh, for the same two optic discs clearly show the difference in appearance of the laminar reproducer between the two optic discs. Here's some more vascular signs that uh, you may observe in a glaucoma patient. For instance, optic disc hemorrhage, uh, which may occur in normal individuals as well as in glaucoma patients. Its presence in an established glaucoma diagnosis may indicate progression of disease, especially in eyes with normal tension glaucoma. Again, uh, red free photos showing glaucoma progression of this optic disc with total loss of the neuroretinal rim temporally, deep laminar show, inferior disc hemorrhage corresponding to an area of nerve fiber layer loss and an acquired optic disc pit, and bearing of circumlinear blood vessels. Optocellular shunt vessels may appear following a chronic ischemic event affecting the optic nerve head, so they are seen f following saturative vein occlusion. Uh, very advanced in glaucoma, and in orbital pathology with raised pressure in the retrobulbar space, like an optic nerve sheath meningioma. Areas of peripheral atrophy have been observed in glaucomatous eyes as well as in normal eyes. 
they are seen more frequently on the temporal disc margin and less frequently on the nasal disc margin. The beta type peripheral atrophy is an irregular area of complete retinal pigment epithelium and corticapillaris atrophy immediately adjacent to the optic disc margin and is thought to develop due to disturbed choroidal vascular supply to the optic nerve head, the watershed areas described by Professor Sian Singh Hera. Beta zones may be interesting to follow in glaucoma patients as they sometimes enlarge with glaucoma progression. Alpha zone, on the other hand, is a hyperpigmented area of retinal pigment epithelium irregularity separated from the disc by a beta zone. We have no known clinical significance so far. In this right eye, presenting with sudden loss of vision due to branch retinal vein occlusion, the optic nerve is on the small size with vertical inferior and superior notching, laminar showing inferiorly, bionetting, congested retinal veins, and peripapillary arteriolar narrowing, in addition to an intracranial pressure of 44 millimeters of mercury. At the end of this presentation, uh, I would like to remind myself and everybody else that glaucoma is a progressive blinding neurodegenerative disease with specific damage pattern in and beyond the eye. It is not just an optic neuropathy. So far, we don't have any curative treatment and even our diagnostic modalities are far from perfect. The best thing to do is to take a photo. You can now take a photo using your mobile phone, you can share it and consult others and send it even to your patient to keep. Knowing the consequences of diagnosing glaucoma, one must be very careful before committing the patient to a lifelong physical, psychological and financial drain. We should try our best to make absolutely sure that we are dealing with glaucoma, not just another large optic disc, a large cup disc ratio, or worse still, another pathology altogether. Thank you very much.